Hello, noble ones. Welcome back to my channel. This is the Metatron speaking. Today, I would like to talk about the European knight versus the Japanese samurai. All right then, to start this video, I would like to say that um, there are, of course, already quite a few videos on this topic on YouTube, and I have watched quite a few of these for entertainment purposes. In my opinion, I reckon that the problem is the fact that some people use as their only source of information for this topic imagination, video games and pop and film culture. Now again, from an entertaining value then it's okay I suppose but uh, unfortunately in my opinion if we really want to approach this topic historically we need academic approach. European history with oriental history, European literature with Oriental literature. And I've also had a chance to read um, not only university books on Japanese history and in, in, in this case the Japanese samurai, um, but also books in Japanese that actually talk about this very topic. Now before actually starting this evaluation, this historical evaluation and comparison, which will be for entertainment uh, reasons only of course, because such a duel never happened, historically speaking. Um, I would like to mention to you and recommend to you a very good YouTube channel that also deals with topics very similar to the topics that I address in my channel, meaning me medieval weapons and armour and history. That is Knight Errant. Now, um, he is a very good YouTuber. I think he's an excellent speaker. He's very knowledgeable and historically accurate. He also owns a stupendous 14th, 14th century um, harness. So if you like my videos, I am sure that you will also like his videos. So I highly recommend you to have a look at his channel and why not subscribe to him in order to have a different perspective on topics dealing with Middle Ages and history. All right then, without further ado, let's get to it. Hajimemashou. In order to start this topic, we really need to understand what era we're talking about. Because, as I have said already in other videos, the figure of the knight, the European knight, is very different if we are talking about, for example, a knight in the 11th century and a knight in the 15th century. Well, a very similar situation happens in Japan. Now, of course, uh, the, the samurai will not be the same if we look at it, if you look at him in the 11th century and then if we see a samurai in the 15th century. Now, of course, the changes were not as dramatic as in Europe, mostly because um, in Europe we have many countries uh, fighting each other and so there is this um, continuous race between weapons the development of better weapons and better armors to, to, to defend from those weapons. Um, but to, to say that in Japan the weapons and armors were the same throughout the entire history of the samurai is untrue. So again it wasn't as it didn't change as much but it did change. So this idea of the knight being just a man covered in steel who can't move and, and, and the only thing he has is that he has got a lot of steel but if he falls on the ground he's dead, this is preposterous. Um, to give you an idea of what I mean, that the training of a knight started at age 7 when he became a page. He then became a squire at age 14, helping his lord who was a knight, learning helping him put on his armour, training in combat, sometimes even fighting to protect his lord. Um, if he was wounded, for example, in the battleground, and then at age 21, he would then become an actual knight himself. So from age 7 to age 21, all they did was combat training, together with many other things that I have no time to mention now. To give you an idea what it means, I, I would like to mention a friend of mine. Her name is Mary Magazzo, and she's also from Sicily, like me, and she is a Kyokushin fighter, a Kyokushin karate, uh, fighter, a karateka. Now, she started training Kyokushin Karate when she was six years old. Now she is 18. As you can see, she is a professional. She has had seven European titles. She was first four times and she was first in Berlin twice, both with Kata, the forms, and Kumite, the fighting. So, she's a professional. 
Now, let's examine what she can do. If you see these pictures, you see that the way she, the stretching she has and the practice she has is incredible. I'm a big fan. And I have, I have also practiced Gyokushin Karate in my life when I was in Japan. However, if I try to raise my leg the way she does, I would probably end up in hospital. And the reason for that is because she's been training very hard. So similarly, a knight who has been training since he's seven until he's 21, who actually puts on his armor and fights in it, they were professionals. And, and every time that I'm amazed when, when I look at her and her achievements and what she represents as a karateka, I think how much more a knight must have looked, must have been professional in what he was doing as, as from his combat training depended his life. Again, an 11th century knight, mostly male, sword and shield, but in an 11th century samurai, uh, would be a samurai of the Heian Jidai, that is the imperial Japan. Now, at the time, even the, the, the samurais were, were really training a lot with the, um, with the bow, to say one, using the bow, and also uh, the kind of weapons that they were using, the kind of sword that they were using, was not really the katana as we imagine it. It was the tachi. The tachi was similar to the katana, but it was longer, as it was meant to be used on horseback mostly. It was curved, and it was normally mounted with the cutting edge looking downward. Now, the katana, as we imagine it, imagine it now, is a invention of the Muromachi Jidai, or Muromachi period. That's when the katana is born. It's shortened so that it could be used also by infantry, not only by mounted forces. And the samurai himself as a figure becomes someone who can fight both on horseback and on foot. Something that they could do already before, but with the katana it's a lot easier to do so. So from Tachi we have Uchigatana. Now, Uchigatana was mounted with the cutting edge up. Now, just to have a look at the characters, the first character normally is red futoi, and it means, of tachi, I'm saying, and it means thick, and the second character is red katana. Now, a thick katana, futoi katana. However, when they are put together, they become tachi. So, today I have chosen to compare mostly a 15th century knight and a 15th century samurai, although I will give you occasionally some information about the 11th century uh, predecessors of both the two kinds of warrior, but we will focus on the 15th century. Starting from the weapons. Now, beginning from the samurai, of course, we have the daikyu, the bow, that the samurai knew how to use very well. We have the katana, the sword, single-edged, basically a single-edged curved sword, most of the times used two-handed, we have the naginata as a ranged pole arm, which will then be replaced by the yari, more of a spear, let's say, as the naginata mostly will mostly become a female uh, weapon or a weapon used by, by females. So samurai could, could use both pole arms, swords, ranged weapons. So the only limitation to the kind of weapons that they could use was firearms which were completely forbidden from the shogun Tokugawa in the 17th century. Another weapon that they used, which was part of the daisho, was the wakizashi, which is the short katana. Samurais almost never used shields in combat, um, the only exception being the tedate, which was a kind of wooden shield that was used uh, to protect the samurai as he was shooting with the bow. Samurais were also trained in yabusame, which is the art of shooting arrows from horseback. Now moving to the knight, the normal weapons that a knight would use were obviously the lance, which originally was rather long and quite heavy, but then it will evolve into a slightly shorter and much more lighter version. The sword, double-edged, fullered steel blades which in the 15th and 16th century will actually become more pointy in order to penetrate armpits and other less covered areas, areas where plate armour was not present. The shield was used by the, for example, 11th century, 12th century, 13th century, um, 
shields were constantly used. Shields will actually become obsolete with the development of the full plate armour or the full suit of armour. And the knights could actually start using two-handed swords or their swords with two hands. The reason for that is that the left pauldron and the full plate armour did not was enough defence for a knight and they did not need shields anymore. Interestingly enough, we also have a similarity here with the samurai, as the pauldrons of a samurai will become significantly bigger and wider as a substitution of the tedate that I have talked about earlier, the shield they would use as they were shooting with their bows. We have the halberd and the pike itself, which was 3.5 to 5.5 meters long, with a short steel point. We also have maces and flails used to bypass the defensive protection of the opponent's armour. Also worthy to mention the polax, extremely effective in dealing with armour. Moving to the armour, the early warriors of the Yayoi period um, developed a certain amount of uh, weapons and uh, fighting code and also armors that will become the basis of the samurai. The first armors did, included helmets and, and cuirasses and, and also protection for the arms but did not include protection for, for the legs which will be developed later. So the armor in Japan evolved with the diversification of battle techniques differently from Europe, where the armour evolved depending on the foe and the weapons that was facing. Obviously in the 5th century, as horses were introduced in Japan, everything changed. And in the 15th century, with the introduction of firearms and gunpowder from, the, from Europe, from the West, again the armour will change. Now in this video I don't have much time to talk about the, uh, the knight's chivalry code compared to the samurai bushido. Uh, I will make a specific video only dedicated to that. So going on with the armour. Now for simplicity, we can imagine for now three kinds of Japanese armour. The primitive armour can be called the tanko and the keiko. The classical armour, kozane gusok, where Kozane means plate, and these plates could have been made of leather, nerigawa, or iron, tetsu. And then we have the modern armour, the tose gusok, which was developed after Western gunpowder entered Japan. Now, there are many others, different kinds of armour, like the okegawa do gusoku, shinui hishitoji do, munemenui do, Dangai Dogusoku and so forth. I don't have time to examine all of these. I will make a dedicated video if you're interested. The samurai armor was worn to varying degrees by numerous classes, most notably obviously the samurai, but also by the ashigaru, the infantry. We can consider that the pinnacle of Japanese lamella armor is the oyoroi, the great armor, mostly worn by the daimyo, the feudal lords. Now, as the Heian Jidai finishes, leather and iron scales were started to be used until the actual leather was completely removed from the samurai armor, and we have full iron plates, uh, scales, sorry, called kozane, interlaced using either leather laces or silk laces. The colors being used to recognize your ally, ally from the foe. The samurai also used kusari, which means chain. So they also use male armor, although the kinds of rings were used by the Japanese were smaller than the European counterpart, and they also had quite a few different possible patterns, as 4-in-1, 6-in-1, and so forth. What's interesting about Japanese armor is that it was designed to be as lightweight as possible, as the samurai had many tasks, including archery, riding horses, and of course, swordsmanship to perform. Now what's interesting about the kabuto is that the kabuto had had a small opening towards the top in order to permit the gods of war to enter the head of the warrior. The mask that they were using was very interesting because it had many different purposes. It was there to grant facial protection, but it was also there to, to instigate fear on the enemy. So there is also the whole psychological aspect of masks. 
A curiosity about masks is that a samurai kabuto mask, when it's worn, impedes completely the movement of mouth and lips. Now, the knowledge in the 11th century was, as I was saying, was wearing mail. The police considered that mail, though, was normally worn over gambeson. So, gambeson would provide impact resistance and cut resistance, and mail would then consolidate even more the defense of the knight with ex extensive cut resistance and piercing resistance because male armor when it's very well made european male armor it's very difficult to put a needle between the rings never mind a sword so real actual armor male armor is much more resistant to piercing than we think but when we, we imagine the 15th century knight, we are talking about complete full armour. Now, a full suit of armour, full steel suit of armour, was, particularly in southern German style and northern Italian style, was a magnificent invention. Now, to have an idea on the kind of steel that they were using in order to compare it with the kind of weapons that the Japanese were using and armours that the Japanese were using, well, in the 15th century, the kind of steel that the Japanese, that the that the Europeans were using would be closer to modern C45 steel. Just to give a, an overall picture to those of you who actually understand steel well. The armour of a knight was definitely heavier than the armour of a samurai, but please keep in mind that an, a knight's armour would not be that uh, heavy as to impede movement. So a knight could still ride his horse, run, stand from the ground and do many other things just as much as a samurai would. The protection was more extensive, as a matter of fact. So the concept behind the samurai armor was the idea that no armor could really protect you from everything. And so the samurai was preferring, the samurai were preferring to have more mobility. But the, the concept of European armors was very different. European armors, the armors were trying to protect the, the knight from, from almost everything. Now, as you can see in this video here, it is impossible to cut plate armor. It, it would be impossible for, for a European longsword, it would be impossible for a Japanese katana. Now, the long sword compared to a katana, there, you know there is this debate there out there of katana being able to cut more than long sword. Now, I am no cutting expert, but I have to say that even granted to the katana, I, I don't particularly believe this very um, idea. I still think that a long sword is as is a, a very good cutting weapon just as much as a katana. But if you really, if I really had to grant you that maybe the katana could cut a bit more than a long sword, which again, I don't particularly support the idea, but even if I had to, um, the long sword would still be able to cut enough to deal deadly wounds as much as the katana. Now, of course, I know that quite some, some of you will disagree with me here. If you do, which is absolutely fine, let me know in the comments below and show me your points and I will answer your, your comments as I always read the comments of the community because I appreciate the time that you, you use to write them. So with a longsword, the uh, knight would have more reach than a samurai. But I would say that both weapons could be very lethal weapons. So it met much of most of it would have to do with the actual skill of the warrior rather than the weapon itself. Now, talking about the actual techniques and martial arts involved in this, um, often we have this idea of the samurai being a martial artist, you know, an expert, which they wear, of course, but also the knights did. Uh, the one thing that puzzles me, I'm not trying to put the samurai down. I recognize that samurais were amazing warriors, but knights also trained just as much as samurais did. So, of course, there is, you know, talking about the martial art, of course, there is kenjutsu and all the many different schools of kenjutsu. Um, but in, for example, if we look at southern Germany and the treaty, like Gladiatoria, uh, we see that not only the knights were training in martial arts just as much as the Japanese samurais did, but also we, there are a lot of similarities between the styles of kenjutsu and European longsword, historical fencing. For example, let's have a look at the stances. In, Jap in the Japanese uh, Kenjutsu, we know there are many different stances. For example, Jodan no Kamae, 
we find very similar stances in in the Hema manuscripts with stances such as the Fontag and so forth. The Fool, for example, which we could compare to the Gedan no Kamae of Japanese Kenjutsu. And, and it's actually, this doesn't surprise me much because we're talking about two cutting weapons which are used two-handed, double-edged and single-edged, so the techniques will be different, but still. All right then, to finish up, I would like to conclude by saying that I think both warriors were extraordinary, uh, but if I really had to think one of which would have a slight advantage, then in my opinion it would be the knight, because of the armour it was using. But please let me know what you think and your opinion in the comments below. I would like to again thank my friend Yannick for helping me um, find very good pictures of knights and, and medieval helmets. Alright then, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please thumbs up and if you want, subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much for watching and thank you for your time. And remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye.